This episode is brought to you in association with Janice Henderson Investors. It is a marketing communication, not for onward distribution, and the value of an investment can fall as well as rise, and you may not get back the amount you originally invested. Past performance does not predict future returns, and nothing in this episode should be construed as advice. Our discussion is for illustrative purposes only. References made to individual securities does not constitute a recommendation to buy, sell or hold any security, investment strategy or market sector, and should not be assumed to be profitable. Janus Henderson Investors, its affiliated advisor or its employees may have a position in the securities mentioned, not for distribution in European Union member countries. My name is Andrew Chaguri, and today I'm joined by Mike Hurley, who's the portfolio manager of the Henderson Far East Income Trust. And today we're going to be talking about how he has navigated a challenging market in 2022, how the trust has performed over that period, and we'll look at some of the key trends that are playing out in Asia, and most importantly, what's in store for investors in 2023. Mike, welcome. So it's been a difficult period for global equity markets. How have you been navigating the last 12 months and what have been the key drivers of performance? Yeah, it's been a really difficult month. What with Russia and Ukraine, China slowing, and then interest rate and inflationary pressures. I'd like to say that we will be more defensive in this environment than we've actually proved to be. Yield usually is a defensive strategy, and it has been to a degree. Some defensive sectors haven't proved to be that defensive. So anything which has been impacted by rising input costs like consumer staples or utilities because of rising energy prices they can't pass on. So you've had certain sectors which haven't done what they would normally do in a downturn. Saying that, I think we've been okay. Performance-wise, we've certainly been more defensive than the broader index and certainly more defensive than growth. But, you know, there's a tinge of disappointment that may be not as defensive as we could have been. I mean, you touched on rising energy costs there. Looking at the portfolio in 2021, you heard around 4.1% in energy and that has significantly increased in 2022 to around 20 percent how are you investing within that space at the moment is it largely big oil and what is driving your conviction behind that sector at the moment it's not really oil although to be honest i think the hold of the energy complex is suffering from the lack of investment in the last 10 years and actually the demand continues to grow whether we like it or not on fossil fuels they will continue to grow Um, and the lack of investment just means that supply is tight then when you add events such as Russia invading Ukraine and the disruption from Russian oil, etc. Then we get this squeeze in prices. And you know, our view is that that continues, to be honest. Even before Russia invaded Ukraine, we had a positive view on the oil price. But actually, to be honest, most of where we have the exposure is not oil, it's gas. We think gas is the transition fuel here as people move from coal and oil through gas towards wind, solar and other means. So it's, it's really the gas exposure which we have most of in the portfolio. You touched on performance in the first question. It's probably difficult not to bring about the yield of the trust, which in the last time I looked was around 8.6. And that's quite high. First, what is driving that yield? And secondly, what people will be asking is, is that yield sustainable given that we're going towards a recession next year? Well, actually, I did a presentation at the end of October. The, the yield was actually 10%, which is a number I never thought I'd see us produce. And the reason why it's that high is basically because the prices are so low. It's not the fact that we're struggling to find income because we're not. Companies in Asia are producing lots of cash, and these companies in the energy sector and material sector in general are producing lots of free cash flow, lots of dividends. We've got stocks in the portfolio which yield double digit, in fact, quite a few stocks that yield double digit. So it's too high. The reason it's too high is because because prices are too low. And I think over time that yield will fall, but it won't be because we cut the dividend. It was because, you know, the prices will rise to levels which I think are much more acceptable in the longer term. You know, looking at the broader context, I think one of the key trends has been a stronger US dollar. And previously that's had a negative impact on emerging market economies as well as Asian emerging market economies. So how has a stronger dollar so far this year impacted Asian markets? And are they a better place to navigate that going forward? The strong US dollar is usually a function of two things. Firstly, that the US is ahead in the rate cycle compared to most other currencies. You're seeing US treasuries at higher levels of yields than we are in Europe, the UK or Japan for that matter. And also when we've had this period of volatility, the dollar is seen as a store of value. Those combinations have made the dollar stronger. And what that tends to lead to is a lack of liquidity flows moving to and from higher risk assets. So Asia emerging markets have suffered as people have taken money out of those riskier assets 
back into US dollar denominated assets into next year. We're probably seeing a peak in rates sooner in the US than we will elsewhere. As a result, we started to see the US dollar weakening and it's not a big surprise that Asia and emerging markets have started to outperform in that environment. If that continues through next year, then hopefully a reversal in terms of the dollar and in terms of relative performance will be something we can enjoy. You know, keeping on the theme of interest rates, markets with high household debt, that is, such as Australia, South Korea and Malaysia, will be vulnerable to rising interest rates and the squeeze on consumer spending will result in slower growth. How are you taking this into account from a stock selection perspective? In both those cases, they do have household debt and there is some sensitivity to interest rates in Australia, especially mortgages. So there's a risk of rising rates mean lower house prices then you could see less consumption as people's ability to spend diminishes. But in both those countries, actually, the government debt to GDP is very low. Unlike here in the UK, we've got very high consumer debt levels and very high government debt levels. So it leaves us very little room to alleviate some of the problems that are coming. In both those areas, Australia and Korea, not so much. But again, I think we're pretty close to seeing the peak in interest rates, especially in Korea. Inflation started coming off. I mean, I think the inflation issue in Asia is completely different from the rest of the world. We don't have the structural elements of inflation like wages and housing that we have in the UK, US and Europe. So we haven't seen core inflation rising as much in yeah. Asia. And as a result, I don't think interest rates will need to change as much in Asia as they have done elsewhere. Our companies were able to pass on costs in 2022. However, with the cost of living crisis, high interest rates and inflation, they will eventually catch up to companies. But the question is, are we going to start seeing intense margin pressure in 2023? And what type of characteristics or qualities will you start looking for in businesses when pricing power is no longer the it factor, so to speak? The story you pictured there is a very real one. But I'd say it's much more of an issue for companies in the US and the UK. In the US and UK, they've done a pretty good job on the margin front because we've got branded goods which have a degree of pricing power. So despite the fact that you've had rising goods prices, a lot of those have been passed on. That's going to become increasingly tough when demand starts falling. It's okay passing on prices, but actually when there's no demand, that becomes incredibly difficult. So I think you know the earnings weakness which we've seen in Asia, we're about to see elsewhere. Now in Asia, we don't have the same kind of power of brands, the same levels of pricing power. So the ability to pass on those prices has been less. And as a result, earnings pressures in Asia have been much more acute. So I think Asia is actually ahead of the curve in terms of earnings downgrades compared to the rest of the world. So now China, from this point, the slight reopening boosted sentiment and optimism that the economy is on a path to recovery. Has this reopening changed your investment stars on China at the moment? I think in the same way that we thought the recessions in the West have probably been the most obvious recessions in history. Everyone knows we're going into a downturn. In the same way with China, everyone knows we're going into a recovery. We just yeah. don't know when. I'm, I'm a little surprised, to be honest, that they've come out of the COVID zero policy during winter. That seems a little maybe premature, considering, as we know, that cases are likely to expand during the winter months. But it was going to happen. It had to happen. The economy was weak. Unemployment was becoming a pressure. And we started to see protests, albeit minor. So it was going to have to happen. I still think that maybe the markets got a little excited in the short term. So we've seen some big moves on reopening. But I think there's still some challenges. And we really will test Xi Jinping's resolve in terms of the hospital infrastructure, number of cases, numbers of deaths, etc. Yeah. in the coming months. Even so, I think the direction of travel is clear. They need to open up, they're focusing on growth. So we've been adding stocks, well, not so much recently since the rise, but a few months back now, in expectation of this happening, but really focused around consumer recovery. On the view that the stocks were cheap enough, we didn't quite know when it was gonna happen, but it was going to happen. We took that view in the last month or two, and we'll add if the market falls back. One of the major risks of the Chinese economy that people have been talking about all year has been the property sector. Have any changes been made by the Chinese government to warrant any confidence that contagion risk from that sector has been reduced? I don't think contagion was ever really the issue. I just think the property market is very important to the overall level of growth within the economy. And they needed to do something. Uh, if they want to revive growth, it was very difficult to do it without... I'm not going to say a contribution from the property market, but you can't have growth with the property market falling 10% per annum. It just doesn't work. I don't think it was ever a risk of the property market failing because the government will always stand behind it. And we've seen more measures recently to make property purchasing easier, to give liquidity to the developers, etc. So I think 
it's moving in the right direction, but I don't think there's enough to promote a property bubble. Property won't be the driver of growth in, in China. Going forward, it won't obviously be a detractor either. I think yeah. that's what the government wants. Housing is for living, not for speculation, continues to be Xi's mantra. Zero COVID policy had a massive impact on global supply chains. And as such, you know, we've seen increased rhetoric about nearshoring and onshoring, for example. Have you seen companies starting to relocate, so to speak, certain elements of their supply chain out of China? And how realistic is that to have a world where China is no longer the dominant player within their supply chains? I think China will be the dominant provider in supply chains for a number of years, probably forever, to be honest. The supply chains are so embedded. When a big producer, whether it's a US company, a Chinese company, Taiwanese company, when they set up a plant in China, the scale is usually enormous. It's not only that, but you also have the suppliers to that plant all around that factory. Now, to relocate that within a short time scale is almost impossible. China will remain integral to supply chains forever. What we will see is diversification of supply. So maybe the growth in production won't be factories in China, but will be in Vietnam, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, Mexico, etc. As for reshoring rather than nearshoring, well, you'll see high value added goods maybe produced in the US, Europe, and the UK, but mid to low end goods, it just doesn't make sense to do that. Though with some of those challenges that we've talked about still exist and will persist, I think, in 2023, valuations in Asia are still at record lows. Does this kind of provide an attractive entry point into Chinese equities at the moment? I think it's a really interesting time. We've got economies in Asia which will be growing in 2023 more than they were in 2022 and you compare that with the rest of the world which would clearly be going in the other direction so that growth premium which Asia usually thrives on will certainly be in place next year in the same way that it wasn't this year you know Asia is expected to grow something four and a half percent I think world GDP growth is going to be around one the US may be in point something mm. if it avoids recession. The UK is probably a negative, Europe yeah. maybe slight positive. So that growth differential is certainly there for Asia next year. Don't think inflationary pressure will be an issue for the reasons I said earlier. Interest rates are probably close to peaking. And when you put all that together, that's a pretty interesting relative case for Asian equities compared to equities elsewhere. Looking ahead, and if we take the threat of inflation and interest rates out of the picture, what are some of the key risks that you're looking out for in 2023 when looking at Asia markets? Well, the key risks is, uh, I think, you know, if China gets the reopening wrong and we end up with struggles in healthcare infrastructure or a large number of deaths, it's possible that they may actually start restricting movement again rather than promoting it. I think there's only a certain tolerance. And once they reach that point, then we might start seeing restrictions. So a lot of the positivity we've got about the region is the fact that China reopens and the benefits that has for the rest of the region. So that's a possibility. As we well know from the opening, closing, opening and closing, as we saw in the UK, it's never a straight line to normality. And I don't think China will go through the straight line either. So that's a risk. There's also geopolitical issues around Taiwan, around measures potentially from Biden in terms of restricting Chinese specifically companies in terms of access to technology, etc. And there is risk of clearly China retaliating. So those two are the main areas. You know, if we have a reasonable reopening in China and some pragmatic response, I think, and it's quite interesting that some of the talking that's been happening between the US and China since the G20 in Bali back a month or two ago, we should think that's encouraging. So taking all those things into account, what is your outlook for Asian dividends in 2023? I think it's going to be a good year. I think we, we will have growth this year, which will be higher than last year, both in terms of GDP and earnings, and that will translate into higher levels of cash flow. From the dividend perspective, I think for the region as a whole, a lot of it will be guided by, for the headline numbers, will be guided by where the oil price is, where iron ore prices are, because energy and materials, big payers of dividends over the last year or two. We expect there to be big payers again this year, but the absolute level may be slightly less than last year. It might be slightly more. It's difficult to gauge. But they are quite prominent in terms of the overall level of income for the region. But underlying, I think, the diversity will be the, the most compelling part. So this year was all about energy and materials. Next year will still be about energy and materials, but it will also be helped by other areas, consumption, banks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So more diverse income next year than we saw this year. Great. That's all we have time for. Thanks for joining, Mike. Thank you. 
And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with anyone you think will also find this interesting. If you want to learn more about investment trusts, we have a wealth of information available on our website, which you can find in the show notes. Important information, not for onward distribution. Before investing in an investment trust referred to in this podcast, you should satisfy yourself as to its suitability and the risks involved. You may wish to consult a financial advisor. This is a marketing communication. Please refer to the AIFMD disclosure document and the annual reports of the AIF before making any final investment decisions. Past performance does not predict future returns. The value of an investment and the income from it can fall as well as rise, and you may not get back the amount you originally invested. Tax assumptions and reliefs depend upon an investor's particular circumstances and may change if those circumstances or the law change. Nothing in this podcast is intended to or should be construed as advice. This podcast is not a recommendation to sell or purchase any investment. It does not form part of any contract for the sale or purchase of any investment. We may record telephone calls for our mutual protection to improve customer service and for the regulated record keeping purposes. Issued in the UK by Janus Sanderson Investors. Janus Sanderson Investors is the name under which investment products and services are provided by Janus Sanderson Investors International Limited. Reg number 3594615. Janus Sanderson Investors UK Limited. Reg number 906355. Janus Sanderson Fund Management UK Limited. Reg number 2678531. Henderson Equity Partners Limited, reg number 2606646, each registered in England and Wales at 201 Bishopsgate, London, EC2M 3AE, and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, and Janus Henderson Investors Europe S.A, reg number B22848 at 2 Rue de Bitborg, L1273 Luxembourg and regulated by the Commission de Surveillance du Secteur Financier. Henderson Far East Income Limited is a Jersey fund registered at Liberty 1923 Lamont Street, St. Helier, Jersey, JE2 4SY and is regulated by the Jersey Financial Services Commission. Janice Henderson, knowledge shared and Knowledge Labs are trademarks of Janice Henderson Group PLC or one of its subsidiaries. Copyright, Janice Henderson Group PLC. Yield, the level of income on a security, typically expressed as a percentage rate. For equities, a common measure is the dividend yield, which divides recent dividend payments for each share by the share price. For a bond, this is calculated as the coupon payment divided by the current bond price. 